Good evening. Uh, I know we have some guests in the audience who were not at school meeting, but I'll be very brief. Sandy Apgar, uh, class of 1958, he went off uh, to uh, the Army Intelligence for some years. He's been educated in graduate schools at Oxford and Harvard. Harvard. He's worked in various consulting groups and he's created his own uh, company in 1980. He then served as Secretary of the Army for President Clinton and he continues to work tirelessly for building great things. Uh, two things you should know, I've said it in school meeting, I'll say it again. More than any single individual, Sandy Apgar is the force behind and the, uh, the philosopher of architecture, you could say, behind our Richardson Romanesque, the, continual, in, the continuity of Annie and Catherine and Lakeside and Armstrong Mifflin's and such. And the second thing is that Sandy is the supporter of young teachers. The APCAR Awards are given here and at, I believe, at Dartmouth and Oxford, if I'm not incorrect. Um, now, Sarah graduated Princeton, and she went on uh, to be a uh, director of building at of new, new uh, stores and facilities at Warby Parker. You know her a bit from fit fighting. You saw her in action on the screen, and you heard from Mr. Pagato some of her exploits at the lab. Uh, both of them have been gracious to come back. Sandy from Baltimore and Sarah from New York City. And uh, let's give them a very warm welcome. All right, thank you so much for having us. We are thrilled to be here. We're going to tell you some stories and talk to you about whether or not you want a job and may want to create your own. So with that, we'll get started. This is a quick agenda for the evening. So my dad's going to share some stories and thoughts about his own life as an entrepreneur to kick us off and some a, a vision and some principles for entrepreneurship and, and this lifestyle and whether it's something that you may be interested in pursuing. I'm going to tell you stories from my current um, companies that I work with. Warby Parker started five years ago and Fit Fighter Training two years ago in two very different industries and we're going to send you off with five lessons for the road. So we are thrilled to be here and uh, look forward to mostly to the conversation after we share about 15 minutes of our lives with you. So take it away, Sandy. Well, it all started with a phone call. Uh, 1974, a long time ago, um, a, uh, a message from a mailboat captain when we were vacationing on a small island in Maine saying, call your office. Well, that was not as easy as it sounds because this was the pre-cell era. And uh, in fact, we didn't have landmines at that point. So leave the island, go to the mainland, find a payphone, four hours, and finally call the office. The reply was, uh, do you want to go to Saudi Arabia? Where? Dahran, Saudi Arabia. Where? Look it up. Uh, and did. And you have to be there by Friday, it's now Wednesday. And to do that meant uh, flying to London, and then Beirut, and then Jeddah, and finally Dahran. Um, well, that started that dialogue with the phone call. Started what became a five year mission uh, to create a consulting practice with McKinsey and Company, one of the major. Uh, strategic management selling firms in Saudi Arabia um, with roughly 20 clients. Uh, we did the national organization plan, a uh, number of strategies for American and uh, foreign companies. And what became at that point, uh, mid-70s, uh, one of the largest consulting practices of its type. So it can be done in a professional firm 
or obviously on your own. And that is um, part of the set of principles that Sarah and I have shared. First, having a vision, a vision that is somehow or other based on needs and serving those needs, whether it's a product, a services in the consulting case, um, there has to be some vision behind mobilizing your energy, your talents. Second, curiosity. If you're a person who asks why about everything, and not just what and when and who and even how, that asks the question of why uh, the curiosity often drives, uh, and I think drives almost all successful entrepreneurs, even unsuccessful ones. Imagination. What's new about what your new enterprise is uh, envisioned? Uh, what's different from the rest? And finally, um, ethics. Um, is it the right thing to do and not just a profitable thing to do? Um, did you invent the idea, new product, new service, or simply innovate? Now, both count. And uh, I would uh, suggest that innovation is, in fact, the more important quality because it often depends on your ability to work with others. And uh, whereas an inventor may work alone, innovators and entrepreneurs work in teams. Um, scroll forward to a second chapter, and this is the second of two, so don't worry, not too long, um, where um, I decided in the mid-90s uh, to embark on a chapter in public service after a career as a professional entrepreneur. And uh, when President Clinton was re-elected in 1996, approached a couple of friends in the, the administration and asked uh, how I could serve uh, without any political background or track record or, frankly, uh, political instincts. Um, that resulted in a, a presidential appointment, uh, which is Dr. Miller's mentioned uh, as Assistant Secretary of the Army, for installations, which is the Army's real estate. Uh, it was then and is today the largest real estate portfolio in the world. And uh, there was a specific problem at the time. Uh, and back to need, what's the need? Army housing was in terrible shape, and there was a huge maintenance backlog, uh, which Congress would not fund. So after a few months in this role, and a mandate from the Senate Armed Services Committee, which controls confirmations, um, a task force that I put together came up with the idea of creating public-private partnerships for military housing. And that has resulted in a program which is the largest of its type in the federal government and has privatized roughly 260,000 houses, units, in virtually every state, raised $20 billion of new private capital, and leveraged taxpayer funding roughly 10 to 1 for every taxpayer dollar, 10 private dollars. So, those are two entrepreneurial stories. Uh, Sarah is going to tell you about actually starting a new business uh, with a very different model. Okay. Thanks, Dad. You walk through the, okay. Did you want to show those photos? Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you. Anyway, that's one of the privatized communities in what had been uh, the derelict housing, and it happens to be in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, outside of Washington. All right, so I'm going to tell you about my two passions, and both of these are stories of companies that are in really different industries, fashion and fitness. And these are sort of my two lifelong, lifetime passions that I wake up with every morning, currently at the moment. And Morgan Parker is a company that some of you may have heard of before. Just raise your hand if you've heard of that company. Just a few of you, great. I saw a few pairs of Warby Parkers tonight at dinner. And the other is Big Fighter Training, which is a company I started two years ago. 
both have really fun uh, stories that I think are, are interesting for you guys to think about as you embark on what's going to be your first passion that you have in your professional career. So I'm going to carry on a thread that my dad talked about, which is identifying a problem and thinking about whether you, as a person, as an individual, someone who loves to think about problems, could, could come up with a solution for. And that's really, in a nutshell, those threads of vision, curiosity, imagination, and ethics. That's what really entrepreneurship is about, is identifying a problem and thinking about a solution. So Warby Parker was solving a really interesting problem. So before about six, seven years ago, a pair of eyeglasses, you buy at Lens Crafters, one of the top brands, Ray-Ban, you know, any of, any of the sort of standard eyewear brands, cost you about as much as your iPhone to buy. And this technology is centuries old, so why on earth does a pair of eyeglasses cost as much as your iPhone? Warby Parker's solution was to start selling eyeglasses direct to customer online. Take out a lot of the middlemen in the process, sell directly to the customer, and then give the additional profits that come from the sale of those eyeglasses to, as part of a social mission, to people who need vision care services around the world. So this model was, you get your eyeglasses at a fraction of the cost that you normally would have paid, and on top of that, we're going to institute a social mission, a sustainable social mission, with a profitable company that gives glasses to, to people who need it around the world. You could buy a home try-on five pairs. You could try on for free at, in your home. And this was their way of sort of connecting you as a customer to the product. So what was the problem that FitBiter Training was solving? So switch industries now to a really interesting niche, firefighter fitness. So in the firefighting world, the problem was that this profession is one of the most, requires some of the most unusual <coughs> stamina of any profession that's out there. And as a Blair athlete, as a Princeton All-American, as a military officer, and now a volunteer firefighter, I have always had this thread of passion for fitness in my life. And when I discovered firefighting, I realized there was a real chasm between what was happening in the fitness setting, in the gym as firefighters were training, and what's really going on out there in the fire ground. So I asked myself, how can we develop a solution to this problem that's scalable? It's not just going to change a few lives and change you know, one firehouse, but something that's going to have enduring impact, that's going to identify a problem and come up with a solution. So what was the solution that, that we came up with at Fitbiter and that we're now trying to grow? Well, Targeted fitness can be packaged. Some of you guys may have tried CrossFit, you may have tried P90X, you may have tried you know, packaged fitness programs that are available on videos, in gyms, you know, through instruction. And these are all ways to train in really specific niches of fitness, whether you're an athlete or whether you're someone that's you know, simply trying to stay fit. So what we did is start a brand, Fitfighter Training, found a brand ambassador who is my partner in crime, a firefighter um, who is on Long Island named Matt Long. And we put together a packaged fitness program that has a fitness tool built of retired fire hose. Ready to think quick? It's got the touch up. <laughs> you alright? <laughs> Perfect. Alright, so that's the tool, the steel hose. We'll show it to you guys in a second. You can pass it around. And then a package of circuit training that comes with that. So what we did was take all the movements that you typically see on the fire ground, which you could equate to movements that you guys use on the athletic field or that you're in your lives. And we developed a simple tool, piece of equipment, and circuit training to go along with it. So when you take a movement on the fire ground, we developed a tool and a movement that was going to train you specifically for that. Take another move, ice rescue, right? Again, something that we do as firefighters on an everyday basis, and we developed a tool and a set of exercises to go with it. So in both of these cases, Warby Parker and Fit Fighter, two really different industries, 
but the same thread that we started with from the beginning, which is using innovation to solve problems. To wake up in the morning and wonder, how can you make the world a little bit different than it was the day before? Through your ability to innovate, work in teams, to solve problems. Warby Parker went from being an e-commerce company to exploring retail. My job now is to build, to oversee the construction of retail stores around the, around the country. Over the last two years, we've opened 19 different locations in 15 different cities. We never imagined that we'd go from holiday pop-ups, selling glasses out of a school bus, and an e-commerce business model, to being one where now we have storefront locations all around the country. A couple of examples of our locations. These beautiful historic buildings were able to renovate and be places you can walk into and experience the brand. This was innovation in a way that the founders never imagined at Warby Parker. They thought when they started that this would always be an e-commerce model, that bringing you know, eyeglasses at a fraction of the cost to you, the customer, was going to be the innovation. And then they realized that the customer command was to constantly be able to walk into a space where you could experience that product. So now, that's what I do, is to build those places around the world. So what was the innovation with Fitbiter? Just play a quick video for you guys. You are not going to see this video right now. All right, we'll have to, um, so I'll tell you a quick story. So when I was just starting to fit fighter, I was looking, I was thinking to myself, what would be the very best possible client customer that I could gain as a proof of concept for this brand? Who's out there that could really represent that I had come up with something really big in the world? An obvious answer to that was the FDNY. So the fire department in New York is the gold standard for firefighting and firefighter fitness. I'm pretty near FDNY's headquarters and just outside New York City. I live out on Long Island. So I asked the director of the fitness unit at FDNY for 10 minutes of his time. And I took my product and I walked into his office and they said, thank you so much for 10 minutes of your time. They said, I want to show you something. And I grabbed this, the steel hose, which you guys are passing around, and I cleared all the furniture out of his little office, and I said, give me five minutes, and I'm going to show you why this is something that you need to, for the FDNY to train with. And I started doing, you know, my burpees right there in the office, you know, just getting down the ground, you know, push-ups, showing them that I had this tool that could really you know, equate to firefighting maneuvers, hold hose handling, search team operations, all the ways in which we had innovated with a tool that we had built from recycled fire hose as a fitness weight and how this could equate to their gold standard of training. And five minutes later, five minutes later I found myself with all six trainers in the FDNY's fitness unit in their functional training center exploring with them the ways that they could use this at FDNY. And now, our product and our training system has been implemented at the FDNY, which gives us the proof of concept that we know we have something big. So this is very early stage startup stuff. I mean, this is like still, you know, in the garage, making the product, figuring out the ways that we're going to build this into the future. But it was all about taking that chance being willing to step up in front of someone and say, I have an innovation that solves a problem that you have and you can't possibly say no. And so my message to you guys is, you know, do you have that in you? Is that what you think is inspiring? Is that a thrill? Because that is really the essence of entrepreneurship. So now we've implemented Fitbiter into Fitbody boot camps, to fire departments all around the country. I speak as a leader on this topic at conferences. And this is something exciting that I hope will continue on into the future. We're going to leave you with five lessons for the road with those stories in mind. Number one, entrepreneurship is not a career. This is not just a job. 
It's not just something that you wake up with in the morning and you, you know, take a shower and you go to work at nine and then you come home at five. This is a mindset. This is about what Sandy talked about at the very beginning of the talk. It's about a vision, a curiosity, a problem-solving ethos that every day you wake up with in the morning and you wonder, wow, what's going to be the next problem that I'm going to solve and how I'm going to innovate? This is a mindset. It's not just a career. And by the way, it doesn't have to be your idea. You heard my two stories, Warby Parker and Fit Fighter, that were really different. Warby Parker was not my idea, but I work for that company because I have the same passion for it. And Fit Fighter is something that I hope will grow into my own thing in the future. I'm going to pass it over to Sandy for numbers two and three. Uh, this um, principle of being a team player and a coach and a mentor and all the above uh, is one of these critical principles uh, and behaviors. If you are a team player, then automatically you cross this one off. If you're not, the question is, can you become one? Uh, I do know many entrepreneurs who actually were not good team players. They tend to be loners, but they became team players and coaches and mentors because they had this passion for the new enterprise. By the way, under principle number one, I would add one of those other anxieties is whether you can pay the rent and when you wake up, where that next dollar is going to come from or revenue, a very critical issue. And third, about risk. Uh, do you have a sense of personal risk, a stake in whatever you're doing, or are you uncomfortable with risk? Frankly, there are many people who can't be entrepreneurs, shouldn't be entrepreneurs, may fail at trying because they aren't willing to take personal risk. And that too is an attitude as well as a philosophy, and, uh, and is not something we're all born with. I believe it's learnable. And of course, one's sense of risk grows with failing and the willingness to fail. You've all heard that before. But learning from failures is as important as the willingness and ability to take the risk. And all these stories we hope you have involved a good deal of personal and family and institutional risk on all sides. Number four is to look for adventure in any situation. So I think there's people who look at you know the world and, and the day and it's it's sort of going about life. And then there's people who are looking for an adventure and you know, and I know there's a lot of that that's going on at Blair every day. What's the next prank? What's the next, you know, there's so much here, you know, that's about adventure in every day and what you do. So places to see, people to meet, things to touch, travel. Seeing the world, adventure and a sense of it is critical for any entrepreneur. And finally, you want to finish with a word about service. Well, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the uh, notion of service to others, meeting a need, is inherent with people who create new businesses, new government services, new nonprofits of any type. And uh, if you have that ethos of service, uh, then you at least have the grounding to become an entrepreneur. You may not be one or want to be one, but at least that ethos will be there. Um, there is a, a, uh, a dimension to this uh, I wanted to just close with, um, because we, uh, my wife Ann and I is here, uh, early in our marriage decided that we would embark on a philanthropic endeavor, and yes, Blair has been one of the beneficiaries. This is very small scale. Uh, these are not the mega philanthropies that you read about and may know some of. Uh, this is very small scale and it was entirely self-funded. But we t chose teaching as a, uh, an objective because we had both experienced superb teachers, both in our high schools and in uh, higher education. And we wanted to give back by recognizing and rewarding teaching excellence in various forms and in various places. 
And so we have done that on a consistent basis. Part of the reason for this was the um, uh, not only the need and the opportunity, but the satisfaction that <coughs> it's personal and, in our case, family and it's institutional. Uh, and finally, in a philanthropic endeavor, if you approach it as a service, measuring its impact in some form, in whatever form may be appropriate, between uh, those to whom you donate or give and those who receive. And so with those principles in mind, I think we're ready for Q&A, commentary. All right, so we include our contact information in case any of you guys want to get in touch afterwards. You'd be more than happy to follow up. And we'd love to have the rest of the time for discussion and question and answer about anything that you guys are interested in. Or something. Yeah. Uh, were you ever worried about uh, the risk when you were starting uh, the fighter and uh, what it could have done to uh, uh, where you were going in the future of the company? Yeah. Yeah, we included number three, you know, that principle of risk, because actually, um, I'll tell you two two things that I, I hope will be poignant for you to remember that actually answer the question for me about my approach to risk at a really early stage at Fitfighter, because that's a very new company endeavor for me. Um, number one, which is sort of part of the earlier story I left out, but I'm going to tell it to you because it's relevant to your question, I was fired for my very first job out of business school. So nine months out of graduate school, I'm 32, my husband's going to med school, I'm paying back my loans, and I take this job for what seems like sort of a dream position for a nonprofit organization and end up sort of oil and water with my boss, who had come in from a real large corporation and we just did not see eye to eye and didn't have the same, share, share the same values. And so nine months later, it's like, see you later, I'm headed for the door and I find myself you know, without a job, living in New York, and, and putting a spouse through medical school. So the reason I tell you that part of the story is because that gave me this sense right at that time of what do I really, what am I going to commit to next? Where am I going to go with my life? And, and, you know, what's sort of the next step? And so I spent six months really thinking through that question. And where that led me was that I always, I, I wanted to be in a role with a new company that was starting up because I knew that's where I could have the most impact. But I had a really specific tolerance for risk at that time because of where I was in my life and because of that experience, which by the way, I do not recommend you get fired from your first job out of school. <laughs> do not try to do that. Um, it's a good lesson for me. I haven't gone through it, but I don't recommend it. Um, so... You know, I had this tolerance for risk, and, and joining Warby Parker was a way to be with a company that was growing, that was on solid footing, and that then has enabled me to explore my own entrepreneurial interest with Fitfighter, but notice that I'm still working full-time with Warby Parker and that company as I grow this other company, because for me, the risk right now would be too high to go full-time raise money for Fitfighter and still be in a position where, you know, I have some some financial insecurity to, you know, to move forward with. So I'm right there at some, you know, sort of an early entrepreneurial stage where I'm addressing that question you just asked just head on. And hopefully in the next couple of years, I'll be in a place where I feel like I can take that risk to move on from Warby Parker and, and you know, move into my own endeavor full time. But I think, you know, those anecdotes give you a sense of, for me, that I had to confront principle number three head on, and, and you'll have to make that decision, you know, too, in your own, um, in your own careers. That's my mom. This is a family affair, folks. All right. So go, going into public service, in a secure position, having had a professional career, and being able to break all the China you wanted, 
and, and get done and do something really new and, and revolutionary for in the government. That's for you. Well, Maybe I need to do uh, <laughs> A different type of uh, risk, but um, yes, I did learn in my chapter in public service that um, the most effective officials are those who are not there for a career. Those who can afford to take risks because they are not seeking the next star or the next pay grade. Um, and that was a central finding I hadn't expected, but became clear very quickly. Um, I also learned that putting up with the system, in this case government and uh, military in general. By the way, I had served in the mid-60s in the Cold War, then Cold War, and so I knew what the Army was about, uh, but had known as a very junior officer. In this case, um, having a presidential appointment was obviously a major responsibility, but it was also a function of uh, solving the problem, as Sarah has mentioned, and taking on risks that no one else would. My personal staff bet that within six months I would resign because every day there was some new obstacle from Congress or from others in the Department of Defense or from anywhere else in government. So the ability to absorb what I came to call wearing a flak jacket and, and taking the fire, if you will, taking the heat from innovations and uh, new initiatives is a, a critical element to any successful venture. Uh, but in this case, in government, it's exacerbated, it's exaggerated by the system itself. And so entering that kind of public service uh, is, yes, entrepreneurial. And in this case, the program was new and innovative, uh, but it also involved uh, knocking down many myths and shibboleths and uh, obstacles. And that, of course, brought the risk right home, almost every night, as my family uh, discovered. I have two. Um, Sarah, you were a platoon leader in Iraq with the 101st Airborne. Could you summarize some of the things you learned from that, uh, that war, uh, war zone? And then for your dad, who served during the Cold War and then in the post-Soviet quiet days, could he say a few words or give us his thoughts on the current war warfare in that region? So could I get you to talk about your war experience and dad to talk about what he think, what he sees out there now compared to the Cold War? Keep us here. Okay, I was going to say, how long do we have, Dr. Miller? A summary. <laughs> um, so I spent one deployment in Mosul, um, and we I was with the Engineer Corps, so we were building, which was always a great thing to be doing over in Iraq. And, you know, I, I mean, I would say, to summarize, you know, I, I think there's probably only a couple of you in this room, I would imagine, that really um, have probably in your lives understood what it really means to be in a place where there is a culture and a society that is so incredibly viscerally divided over deep, long, culturally rooted issues that are just disabling them from anything that feels like progress. So, you know, anything that feels like a, a progressive, modern sort of, you know, system and basic things that we appreciate here, stoplights, you know, flushing toilets. I mean, these are not things that exist in these countries where there's this historically divided population of people. And that was the thing that for me just opened my eyes in these ways that you know, growing up and coming to Blair and going to Princeton, you don't, you don't understand what those, what that means, because we take for granted that you stop at a red light. 
but in Iraq, nobody's stopping for a red light. Why, why, would you, why would you stop for a red light? Why do you guys stop for a red light? Why do you stop? Yeah. It's the law. It's, it's what you do. It's our laws. You're going to get a ticket. There's a consequence. We have decided as a society that we should organize in a way that connects us through societal values and laws. That's what we decided. And that's something you don't remember when we decided that because none of us were alive. But those issues, are, there's deeply seated issues that are thousands of years old in the making that are still plaguing people and countries that you guys hear about mostly on the news. And that for me, I think, was what to learn about how to relate to people in that environment and try to help in the little way that you can make a difference. To build a new school or to, you know, help to, you know, build a, pave a road or an airfield. I mean, those are the little things that we were doing and to, to try to be appreciated and, and be able to do that every day and feel like you were making just a tiny piece of progress amidst something that was so much bigger than yourself and so hard for us to understand. I think that is really in that conflict what I learned and that's what you're still hearing about every day. And I'd like to think that those little tiny bits of progress that we made will, will be enduring you know, long into the future, but um, I, you know, I think in that kind of environment, that's what you learned that I that I brought back here. We were last here in 2006, and uh, on the way out, was reminded that in 2006, I can find it here. Um, we once we lost it. Um, put together a contrast between the Cold War and the War on Terror. Now, of course, uh, there it is. Um, the issue in the Cold War was a dominant nation-state, Soviet Union, um, which was clearly the enemy. We all believed that they were the enemy, um, and uh, it didn't matter uh, who they were, where we were, and all of that, and with very few exceptions, what it would take to, quote, defeat the enemy. That was a very clear, sharp divide, and if um, some of us were on the front line, this happens to have been a real sign from then East Germany, uh, in the area where I was stationed. My role, incidentally, was um, recruiting scientists from the Carl Zeiss optical factory, which was then as now in Vienna, uh, then East Germany, uh, a couple of miles across the border, and bring them across surreptitiously, undercover, uh, generally at night, um, and uh, with their families or without, and then resettling them after we interviewed them for several weeks, resettling them either in the US or UK. But this was very real. That strip, that brown strip was mined. There were guard dogs, there were guard towers, and that's barbed wire that you look at. So it's a real phenomenon. Today, we have, as you know, a... Where are we again? Yeah. Got to keep losing you going the other way. Because I hit it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I had this all carefully mapped with it. Um, uh, anyway, uh, we, we don't have a clear enemy. We have people who represent a diffuse, uh, often non-identifiable, and isolated uh, culture uh, and a doctrine that we don't understand, we in the West generally don't understand. Uh, and of course, we also have now a technological environment which enables them to be just as sophisticated and in some respects more so than we are for all of our resources, all of our talents. So the contrast between then 
uh, mid 60s uh, and now, uh, 50 plus years later, is as stark as one could imagine at any point in history. I think Dr. Miller is a historian and I'm not, but um, this is a very, very sharp divide. The question is whether our policies reflect this contrast or whether we still are operating with policies that were designed for the Cold War, or at least designed for a conscious enemy that we could, quote, defeat, or whether we have accepted a different structure, system, certainly culture, and know how to deal with that, uh, in my view at least, is, has not been defined and is not well understood. That's longer than the Jew. Dr. Miller, you took us way far away from fitness equipment. <laughs> get back. Happy to talk about it, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sarah, I was going to ask if you could talk a little bit about the process of identifying uh, locations for new stores for Warby Parker. I remember um, when Starbucks was in their early years, they went, they were going from corner locations and, you know, uh, Two streets net, that sort of thing, all the buildings and so on. Talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's something that's really interesting for, again, an innovative business model that started as an e-commerce company online, right? Warby Parker is a tech company. Well, what does that mean? That means that we have a huge amount of data about our customers, where they are, what they like to buy, where do they live, what are their addresses, are they centered in urban areas, rural areas? We know that because we built our database of information online as a tech company. That's not a traditional you know, retailer of a product. So to answer the question about how we find you know, our next retail location, we're able to use an analysis of around the world of where our customers are to understand where we can be successful in a, in a bricks and mortar retail setting something that Starbucks really wasn't able to do. It's a, it's a huge departure from a standard retailer that was going to look at, hopefully, you know, an urban environment, sort of hope to analyze a market for maybe other successful retailers in that market, and really have to base everything off of what was happening around them, whereas we can base everything off of what's happening right inside Warby Parker. So we have a huge advantage as an online, offline, retailer and e-commerce company where we can take advantage of that data and forecast where we have the very best chance, the optimized chance of being successful. And that's why you're seeing stores in places like Kansas City and uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and places where people are surprised that ahead of having our second location in San Francisco, we know we have a big customer base and some interesting second tier markets around the country. So again, this you know this flipping this business model on its head to design the company the way it was designed is an example of you know innovating across the board, not just from the beginning, but into that unexpected bricks and mortar retail. Yeah. Building off of that, do you have uh, um, the IDOC that are the, the are they part of your company or do you hire them um, to come in or how are they invested in, in there? Like I know those tractors sometimes will, you can either find the company or they hire optometrists. Yeah, so we, we can hire in about half the states, it's actually by state law, we can hire optometrists who are eye doctors who give you your prescription into as employees of the company itself. And then in about half the states, we actually have to have optometrists as independent contractors for, you know, who are working as a sort of a subcontractor of the business and have a, an attached, you know, an um, optometrist practice that's attached to our store. So in every case, we can have optometry practices associated with our stores. Um, and yeah, it's pulled up a great photo. So there's our eye exam room and our flagship in Green Street, which is our biggest uh, New York City flagship in Soho, downtown. 
And so our optometrist is on staff. The state of New York allows us to hire them right as employees of the company. And they operate in our retail stores um, to give full eye exams. Yes, sir. So you talked a lot about taking risks and like, taking smart risks in, in the, how you decide to go ahead with businesses. How did you do that? Because we, we talk to our students a lot about taking risks and did you go with your gut? Did you get advice from people you trusted? Like, how did you decide what kind of risks and how big the ones you take? I'm glad you asked that question. Would you like to take that first? No, I have you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's a great question because, again, one of the threads that I like to be sharing as somebody who I like to think of is not much older than you guys, <laughs> although I did just turn 35, um, you know, to really think about what failure would mean for you. That is how I personally have become sort of affiliated with my own sense of risk. So what I ask is, what am I really, what am I willing to risk? What were you willing to risk to come to Blair? Maybe it was leaving home and that was a big risk for you. Maybe it was you're um, on a work study program and you're contributing financially to your education here. That's a risk. You know, what are the risks that you, you know, what does failure mean to you if you decide to do something and it doesn't work out? You know, where does that leave you? Are you okay with that? Making that decision to do something and it's not going to work out. Trying out for, you know, JV basketball your freshman year, varsity basketball your freshman year. That's a risk. You're sticking your neck out there. What happens if you fail? Well, you get another chance. In high school, the good news is, and especially at Blair, our risks don't have as much consequence. You can try out next year you know, for the varsity team, and it's cool, and your friends are going to be cool about it, and you'll be super bummed if you don't make the team. But as you get along in your career, and you're talking about risk as a major financial factor, can you support yourself? Are you going to... You know, be eating spaghettios or cooking a nice dinner? Are you going to be living in a place that feels comfortable to you? Are you going to be able to buy things that you want to buy? Are you going to owe people money? You know, these are the questions that you start to ask yourself. And so, for me, it's been, what does failure really mean? Defining that for myself and then deciding if I'm willing to take that chance, if I'm okay with that being the result. So joining Morby Parker, it was, well, I'm taking a big pay cut here. I just got fired from my job, paying back some loans. What am I willing to risk here? What salary am I willing to take for this startup job, for this amazing opportunity? How long am I willing to stick with that? So I decided for myself, I'm gonna give this one year I'm going to take a 50% pay cut. It's going to live, you know, a little bit on the cheap for a while for this extraordinary opportunity to be a part of a really big opportunity with big rewards. So if I take this risk, there could be major rewards that I reap from it if it's successful. And I'm okay with what happens if in one year it doesn't work out I can leave the company, I can find something new, and that would be failure. And I was okay with that happening after that year. So for me, I think to, to answer that question, it's really thinking through that for yourself. What does that mean? And you know, we're so fortunate in places like Blair, you know, there are a few of you that probably have had really big failures in your life, and I believe that that's probably true. And there's probably a lot of you that have no idea what it really means to fail to lose a soldier in a war, to get fired from a job. I mean, these are big failures. And luckily, you guys don't know what those mean yet. But, you know, it's never a yellow brick road. So to start thinking through those things when you're going into college and you're looking for your first job, you know, taking risk is an extraordinary opportunity to do something really big. And, you know, 
changed my life, opened every door, and I have sort of lived in a dream life at an amazing company with, you know, a second startup opportunity on the way, and so it was worth every minute of that risk. But there was a lot of downside to that, and you have to be comfortable. A footnote, I went through two different stages of risk. When I set up the um, consulting practice independently of McKinsey, um, we had two young children, including Sarah, and a mortgage, and all of the other overheads that uh, anyone would at that stage. Um, took the risk because I had confidence that there was a market, that is, that there was a need to be served, and that I had the skills to pursue it. Frankly, I did not appreciate until much later just how deep that risk was. Had I done so, I might not have done it. It is possible to overanalyze this issue and then, frankly, never pursue it. The second stage of risk, as, as already uh, been mentioned earlier, was in the uh, Army role. Um, the risk protection that I felt was actually the sense of mission. Uh, Sarah and Dr. Miller both used the term passion, and it's an accurate one. But I prefer mission. For me, it is the sense of, of achieving a mission in which I believe. And um, did have a mandate from the Senate committee that confirmed me, fix Army housing. Sounds daunting at one level. But I had 100% confidence that I could do that as long as I persisted. And uh, as Anne mentioned, broke a lot of China to do it. That's a euphemism for breaking a lot of rules. Uh, no laws, but many rules and traditions and cultural innovations. Those are the sorts of risks that in a big organization, whether it's government or business, you have to be willing to take if you're going to be an innovator of some kind. Two quite different classes of risk, I think. Any last question? Uh, I think we are good. Thank you very much.